Yeah, I think, um, you know, they're certainly a lot better than their record, that's for sure. And, and if you look at, you know, a lot of their last games, I thought they played really well against New Hampshire, um, you know, played really well against BC and really get well against Northeastern. So in their last six games, I think they've been playing great hockey. They're a team that uh, has always given us a hard time. So, um, I, I think they're good in goal. I think their defense is really good with uh, Ewins and Carlisle and Holloway and Vanell. I think they're really strong. Those four especially are really good players. And up front, they have four lines. They have a lot of depth that uh, they play pretty equally. So it's uh, I'm expecting a really you know fast paced physical series this weekend. Okay, we'll start with Dan Connolly from UConn Blog. Dan, go ahead. Hey, Gav. So do you have an update on Roman Canals? Yeah, Roman uh, right now is dealing with a um, MCL. So he'll probably be out, uh, I would say, a minimum of four weeks. Is that it today? Is that it? Anyone else here want to jump in? Dan, go ahead again, and then we'll go to Adam. This is your third weekend in a row actually playing, and this is the first time you've – well, last weekend was the first time you'd even played in back-to-back -back weekends. So is it important to be able to get a bit of a routine going and have a more consistent schedule compared to the way the first half went? Yeah, that's a good point. I think it is. I think it's, uh, it's nice, and let's keep our fingers crossed that those tests come back negative today so we can put three weekends in a row together because I think it, it helps with you uh, getting into the routine that you just talked about but also you need game reps you know and you need consistent game reps and kids uh, it's never the same in practice as it is when you're playing against a hockey East opponent so hopefully like I said all those tests are negative and we can put you know three weekends in a row uh, here together. Uh, go ahead, Adam from ESPN Radio. So, Coach, you mentioned how Merrimack's always given the Huskies a pretty good run at it the last few years, and so uh, they took two out of three a year ago. Um, specifically, what things does this year's team do differently maybe than uh, last year's group that you're going to have to adjust to? You know, I don't know if they do things differently. Okay. I think it's uh... – you know, I really respect the game that they play. It's, there's nothing fancy about it. They're going to come, they play in your face. They transition very, very well uh, out of their zone. And I think a lot of that has to do with their mobile defensemen. You know, their defensemen can get up and join the play. Uh, they skate well. Uh, Jeffries is an excellent player up front. He's a freshman this year, and I think he leads their team in scoring. But he's a big, strong kid. Uh, so... They're just not a lot of holes in their game, you know, and, and I think they're a team that, uh, you know, thrives on uh, physical play and, and playing at pace. So it, it's, it's just going to be another tough hockey East opponent for us. What a Bob Joyce. Yeah. Hey Mike. Uh, Ryan Torberg. Uh, last first couple of weeks that he's been on the ice in game action. What have you thought of his play so far? I've been um, really impressed with his play. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I had never seen him play live. Joe uh, Pereira had seen him play live and he was trying to, uh, you know, explain what type of player he was to me or describe him as a player. And I watched him on video play some games this year, uh, which is always tough for me anyway. And, uh, but I, I've been really impressed with how he, he, first of all, he jumps off the ice with his skating. He's an electric skater. And then his compete level has been uh, fantastic. You know, he, he gets in and he plays physical. He has quick hands. I think he's going to be a guy that can score a lot of goals for us too in the future. Uh, go ahead, Dan Connolly. What's so different about watching players on film as compared to seeing them in person? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a lot different because 
you can't see a lot of play away from the play sometimes like it's always focused on the puck i can't tell uh body language on the bench uh those types of things um it's very hard to judge the speed of a game by watching it on film uh even an nhl game like there's some nhl games you go to and you're like god this is being played at a snail's pace you know uh but when you're live at the game you can actually see and feel how fast the game is uh so I just think television and video takes that away, that that feeling when you're at the game and you can actually see how fast uh, players are. So um, th those are a few of the things for me. Uh, morning, Jerry, go ahead. Morning, Bill, morning, coach. What's up um, with that Minnesota hat, Jerry? Well, you know, I try to have a different hockey hat every time, try to do something a little different. How about a Yukon one? I do have a Yukon one in mine, and I have worn it, so uh, right. <laughs> so hopefully I won't I won't get any demerit points this afternoon. Um, just to take a look at how your team has played this weekend, uh, you talked about identity after the game. Do you think you've seen a bit of an identity begin to form for Yukon? You kind of went toe to toe with the number one team in the country. Do you do you see that this week uh, in your practices? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that this week has been any different than in the other weeks. It's, it's been an identity that we've been striving for for a long time. And I think our kids understand. And when you have an older team, uh, they understand the identity. And they, they understand what their expectations are and how, we're, how we want to play and what makes us successful. So I think, uh, as I said, with a veteran team, it's a lot easier to play to that identity. Uh, you did a little line shifting before uh, the game Saturday afternoon, uh, shifted a few guys around. Do you plan on doing that a little? Or are you going to go back to your regular rotation against Merrimack? Yeah, I'm not sure yet. I, I mean, we're, we're still tinkering with that this week. Uh, so probably I, I don't love tinkering and changing lines all the time. I, I kind of like to have some type of stability there. Uh, Every now and then in games, there's some kids that are going and some kids that aren't. So you try to put hot sticks together. But for the most part, I'd like to try to keep some stability, especially as you start moving into February and, and March during the playoffs. You like familiarity with players, uh, with each other. So that's not something I plan on doing on a weekly basis is, you know, tinkering and changing lines all the time. Last question about health, and that comes as we get to this month. Uh, as you said, you're trying to get into the season. Uh, how is Roman Canal's uh, situation coming into this weekend? Yeah, he, he's going to be out, and uh, he, he's got a knee injury, and he'll probably be out for about four weeks. And uh, how's Lad? first off? He took a wicked shot off, blocking a shot the other. How's he just a uh, bumped and bruised hockey player going into the weekend? He hasn't missed practice. I think he's fine. Thanks very much. Appreciate it, Mike. Sure. All right, let's go to uh, Adam from ESPN. Coach, uh, Nick Capone is somebody who came in with uh, a, a big reputation preceding him. What area has he grown the most uh, over the course of his freshman year? I think his patience with the puck is growing. Uh, you know, he's always been a big physical player, he, and he has great ability to make plays. I think the area where he's grown the most is patience. At first he was just throwing pucks away, but now I think he's understanding that I have more time than I think I can protect the puck. I'm a big kid. Uh, so I don't have to throw that puck away right away. So I think that's one area that he's really improving on. Uh, I'd also like to see him shoot the puck more cause he can, he's got a pro shot. So I'd like to see him generate more shots on net throughout the game. We'll go to Joe zone from channel three. Joe. Yes, good morning. Mike, you, you talked about the difference between seeing players on tape and in person. How's that impacted your recruiting? Well, it's, uh, it's impacted us as far as two years down the road. Uh, we don't have a great feel for players two years down the road where this time of year we normally would. Uh, next year's players are kids that we all had a chance to see play. But, you know, coming up on this March will be a year where we haven't been out watching hockey, like, live. Uh, so 
you know, I think anybody would, and I, I just don't really want to do it. I don't want to take players uh, that we've just seen on video. I, I want to be able to get eyeballs on these kids live before we commit to them. So I think the biggest, uh, you know, area where it's affecting us is a couple of years down the road. Thanks. That's a really good point. Appreciate it. Okay. We'll go back to Bob Joyce. Yeah, Mike, you've gotten a couple of goals from blue line last couple of games, Jan on Friday and then Jake on Saturday because there was traffic in front of the net. Is that an area where you feel the team's gotten better in recent weeks to create the traffic in front? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. I think that's one, but I also think it's our defensemen getting pucks on net and keeping them down. You know, we were having a problem. I thought we were shooting too many pucks high and over the net. It's really hard for our guys uh, – for pucks to go in the net when they're up shoulder high or crossbar high. Uh, yeah, it might go in and the goalie might see it, but we've got a much better chance of scoring goals when the pucks are 12 inches off the ice. Uh, th those are hard to block. Uh, <coughs> they get over goaltenders pads and it's a much different save for the goalie to make. And it's a much easier puck to tip. So uh, I think it's been a combination of us you know, getting in front of the net, but also our defensemen keeping pucks down and shooting in good spots. I will go back to Dan Connolly. Coach, most of your season's been when there hasn't been a student body on campus. And I think earlier in the year, you mentioned that most of your teams either in Garrigus or in Oak. So is there a concern about that dorm or those apartments possibly being quarantined again and not being able to have enough guys that are allowed out to play a game or are there different restrictions for players that are in season with that type of thing? I, I mean, I, I, it's something I can't control, Dan, uh, when the players come back, I'm, I'm hoping that's not the case. Uh, you know, I think right now that uh, our guys are just trying to, to manage it the best they can. Uh, and, and as I've said all along, uh, you can't be a prisoner to your dorm room. I mean, the, the guys for their mental health, they have to get out a little bit. And, but at the same time, you have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that you have to be responsible. So uh, respectful and responsible. So that's what I'm asking them to do, Dan. And if for some reason a Garrigus gets shut down or a Hilltop gets shut down or the Oaks gets shut down, it's, not, it's out of our control. There's nothing we can do. I'm more concerned about our guys test a negative every week than I am about the rest of the student body. Uh, we'll go back to Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, uh, Coach. Um, just to follow up on the question regarding dealing with your recruiting process. I mean, this year you don't have a chance. You don't go to, you can't go to an Avon Oil Farms or a Taft locally, and you're really relying with the USHL, and, but the BCHL was not playing. Can you even give us a fuller sense of just how truncated even your whole recruiting process has now become because of COVID? Yeah, I think I, you know, touched on that a little bit. It's just anything we're doing for recruiting right now is either players that we have already seen, uh, players that may be, uh, you know, I think what's going to happen here in the, in, the, in the spring is that there's going to be a lot of players that, are expecting to go into a college and because of the extra year of eligibility, there might not be room for them to go into that college. So there might be players that we have been involved with before that can't go to school. And if we have an open spot, we'd be amenable to taking those kids. Uh, if we think it's a good fit, uh, the, the biggest uh, issue and difference we're facing right now is like I said, recruiting a couple of years down the road because we, normally have a good handle on those kids and uh, because we haven't been able to go out and watch games we just don't right now uh you've got a workhorse and a goaltender in thomas fomashka he was excellent over the weekend the glove save he made on danny Waite is uh one of those highlight plays uh and shows the skill level he has even just sitting down he can make glove saves um he's become an, an intriguing and very important part of this team's uh growth and development um just how much down the stretch? I mean, you worried about maybe maybe having too much work or not enough work with all the things that are going on. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be too much work. Um, you know, good goalies at the college level 
are used to playing back to back Friday, Saturday nights every week. Uh, if you look around this time of year, most teams are settling in on one goaltender to play their games the rest of the stretch. So uh, I, I'm not concerned with Tomas's workload for sure going down the stretch. Thanks, Coach. Yep. Okay, we'll go right back to Dan Connolly again. Coach, I don't know if this is too early to ask, but you mentioned the extra year of eligibility from the NCAA. So do you have any sense of if you're planning to bring any of your seniors back for next season? Well, I think I would entertain bringing them all back. I think that's just going to be their personal choice. Uh, you know, they, I think they've all been great contributors to this program and they're excellent students and they do things the right way. So if, you know, but it, it's such a, I don't think it's a topic we can broach right now. I think that's a conversation for when the season ends. Uh, but from my standpoint, I think they've been great ambassadors for our program. And if they were interested in taking another year, I'm certainly open to it. Uh, let's go to Andrew from the Boston Globe. Andrew. Hey, Mike. Um, after last week, BC tweeted out a pretty cool shot of, of Jerry talking to Gino. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment. Obviously, you had your long history with Jerry, and I, I know you've gotten to know Gino. Just if, if you could comment about, uh, you know, working with, with those guys or, or what your friendship with, with those guys. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Jerry's a little different. He's more like a father figure in, in the professional world to me. Uh, you know, he gave me my start at Boston College, and uh, I've known him since 1992, a long time, almost 30 years now uh, that I've known Jerry. And so that's a little bit different relationship, as in when I came here, I met Gino, and now that relationship has grown over the last eight years, and we've become pretty friendly and share a lot of different things, and we'll play some golf together and those types. So I, I, I they're both different in the same in a lot of ways, like uh, they're both, you know, competitors, but the thing about them that I really, uh, I find interesting is they're never bigger than the school. You know, both of them have 1100 wins. They're both arguably the greatest coaches in their sport, college sport of all time. And if there's a head coaches meeting, they're there. They're not too big for the head coaches meeting. You'll see Gino doesn't have to spend a Saturday afternoon at Freitas Ice Rink watching my team play. Uh, but the athletic department's important to him. And Jerry's the same way. If, uh, you know, if it's not a COVID season, you'll see him on an October night watching the field hockey team play. Uh, he's all about Boston College and supporting all those athletes there. And, Jerry doesn't miss head coaches meetings. Like he shows up. He's not too big for the, what some might deem below them. Those guys don't think that way. And I think that's a really impressive quality that, that both of them have uh, that I certainly try to live up to myself in, in supporting other athletes and coaches on this campus. Um, that, that's one thing that they both share that I think is really impressive and which makes them really well-balanced people too. Uh, they, have, they have other interests in life. So I went over to congratulate Jerry uh, after the game and I knew Gino was there and I just thought it would be a cool opportunity for the two of them to in engage and meet, so. So you, you, you sort of introduced them at that moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, brought oh. Jerry. I went over to congratulate Jerry and then uh, I said, hey, Gino's here. Why don't you come over and meet Gino, so. Cool. It was good. The two of them got to chat for a little bit. Um, I, I know you don't know, you know, your the rest of your schedule going forward beyond this weekend, but <clears throat> given that you've played UMass three times and BC four times, you know, seven out of your first thirteen games are against top ten teams. How do you feel like that sets you up for the for the rest of the season? Um, I, I think it certainly gives our kids confidence. I think you know, even against UMass. You know, the last time we played them, it was a whatever it was, a 5-2 game or 6 I can't remember. But 5-on-5, five five, it was an even game. Uh, our special teams, that was the difference in that game. They scored three power play goals, and we didn't score any. Uh, now, I know that's an important piece of the game, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm always concerned with how are we matching up against teams 5-on-5. Five five. Uh, 
I think that's really important. And when you get into the playoffs, a lot of times fewer penalties are called. And of course, special teams are important. That can get you that one goal that you need to win a hockey game. But the biggest indicator for me is how are we playing five on five? And against in those seven games, with the exception of the first one, I thought UMass really had the upper hand in that first game we played of the season. Mm -hmm. We've played those teams pretty even five on five. And uh, I think that's given our team a lot of confidence that hey, going into the playoffs, uh, when the time comes, uh, God willing, we're healthy, that, you know, we have a team that can compete at that level. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Dan, back to you. I asked Gino yesterday about coming to the game and he mentioned how he fell in love with hockey when his friends from home went up to Canada for college and came back with hockey gear. And um, he had this quote, I'm quoting, you haven't lived until you've had 12 beers and go to a hockey rink you rented out at midnight and played hockey with a bunch of guys who knocked you on your butt. So I'm curious if you've ever lived according to those standards by Gino. I don't think he has. Has he ever been on skates? <laughs> Claims he has. Oh, well, I'd like to see him after 12 beers at midnight at the Freitas Arena. That'd be worth being <laughs> coming to watch. Uh, no, I don't really. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Maybe in college I had, Dan, but uh, I don't think I've done it post-college. That's for sure. Certainly not now. I'm not doing that now. But that's classic. Yeah. Okay, anything else from anyone today? Uh, just uh, one final qu uh, question, uh, Bill. Uh, yeah. For coach. Yep. Okay. Uh, coach, your big players came up with big goals uh, the weekend. When Johnny Evans with a big goal. Is that also a good sign of the maturation of this team that your your bigger players are coming to play in those big moments in games? You know, I think that's the true in in any in any big game. A lot of times. You know, you always need secondary scoring in hockey. I think that's very important. You see teams with Stanley Cup runs, and they always seem to find that secondary scoring. But very rarely do you see teams win championships without their top players playing well. I mean, you, you just, you know, Tom Brady plays well and Tampa Bay wins. It's, uh, it's just you have to have that. Um, so, uh I was, it was great to see that. And that's something that we're going to need down the stretch uh, with our club. So yeah, it was great to see last weekend. Thanks again, coach. All right. We're going to finish it up with Dan for a quick one and then we'll call it a day. Go ahead, Dan. Besides Roman, are you expecting anyone else to be out or are you not sure about anyone else's status? No, I, like as of right now, I think Roman's the only one who won't be available to play. So yeah. Uh, if that changes, uh, I'll be sure to let Bill know and let you guys know. But as of right now, Roman's the only one who's not available to play.